All right, I think we're ready to get started here. Um, welcome everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm Eliza Rohde, I'm on the Acumen America team and um, a proud team member uh, working with, with great entrepreneurs like Abby and many others um, who are building really, really powerful companies, really inspiring companies. Um, we're kicking off our third conversation in, in this series. For those of you who may have tuned in before, um, the series that we've been running with some of our entrepreneurs on tackling poverty and racism in America. Um, and I'm really excited for you all to get to know Abby Wima of Isusu, who's with me here today um, a bit better. <laughs> uh, he's an incredible human and um, you know has a lot to share. So. Um, I wanted to start a little bit just to give some context on the series for those who haven't joined us before. Um, it's obviously been a really challenging year in the U.S. on some fronts, and um, I think it's a year that's exposed and exacerbated a lot of the systemic and structural um, challenges that fuel poverty, inequality, um, and racial injustice in this country. <clears throat> and I think at Acumen America, these you know these challenges and these these fractures in our society are really the reason that we exist. Um, our work is to find entrepreneurs, um, leaders and innovators like Abby and many others who are building solutions that have the potential to shift the way that low income Americans are, are able to access critical um, and, and products and opportunities across the areas of, of health and financial services and, and opportunity for work. Um, and our overarching goal is really to build towards towards a country where all Americans have the ability to to self-realize to their fullest potential. Um, I think as we've grappled with many of the the blows of this year um, and and the disproportionate impact um, adverse impact on on the population that we exist to serve, um, particularly Black and Brown communities. Um, we've doubled down on our work, but we've also, you know, really focused on, on how do we elevate and, and amplify the voices of um, the inspiring leaders that are closest to us, and, and those are our entrepreneurs. And so um, today I'm really excited to do that and um, to formally introduce Abby and <clears throat> to let him share a bit about his story and what drives him. Um, Abby and his co-founder, Samir Goal, who's not with us today, but also you know one of our one of our favorite entrepreneurs. Um, you're building an exciting company to advance financial inclusion and financial health in the U.S., and um, which we'll dive into a bit more here in a second. Um, but yeah, more importantly, um, or as importantly, they really exemplify the the type of leaders that we're excited to support, um, who see an opportunity to change um, and and create a more just society here in the U.S. And they're really running full speed toward towards that vision, um, often with more stamina than I would imagine possible. Um, <laughs> so uh, excited for, for us to kick off here. And um, I'll try and stay out of the way as best I can and let Abby do most of the talking because that's why you're all here. And so maybe Abby, we could start off just um, you know with an easy one. If you give a, a brief intro of, of who you are and, and Isusu, uh, provide a little context um, for the audience and then we'll we'll dig in. Um, thanks a lot, Eliza, and thank you to the Greater Acumen team for creating this thought-provoking conversation. Um, you know, we're grateful for um, the support and above all, just the investment um, that you and the Greater team have essentially taken on. Um, Samir, my work husband, and I, um, and the Greater Institute team. From a background standpoint, um, I grew up in the slums of Lagos, Nigeria. Um, I was raised by a single mother and lost my father at the age of two. Um, one of the things that my mother believed was the paramount investment in any child's life was a good education. So my mother afforded my school fee to one of the finest middle school and high school in Lagos, Nigeria. And that was the pipeline for me being here today. So fast forward, um, during those times, we didn't have a lot, but one thing we did have was just the fact that if we work hard, play by the rules um, and then just persevere against all odds. The sky is just the beginning to what we can accomplish in life. So I grew up on an average 78 degree weather, transitioned to Minnesota on a cold winter, mm -hmm. negative 22 degrees, uh, no light fits, strong, <laughs> strong cats. So cruel, so cruel. <laughs> it was, it was. But Minnesota taught me a lot about myself. 
Um, I got involved in the political process early on, working for President Obama's re-election campaign. And you might, you might be shocked. I was working in the northwestern region of Minnesota, so very white, um, and you know, just talking about an idea I fundamentally believed in. And that's, in my opinion, is an interesting piece of America where you can come from a different country and really talk about how you can contribute your own humble quota to the developments eminent um, in the landscape. Um, fast forward, I had an opportunity to work in corporate America um, when I moved to New York City for um, graduate school. I worked at Accenture, Goldman Sachs, and PricewaterhouseCoopers, where the impetus for the work we do at Isusu is really drawn from our journey coming from Lagos, Nigeria, my mother and I, to Minnesota. You see, Eliza, when we came to Minnesota, we didn't have a credit score, a financial identity. We walked into one of the biggest banks. I will not mention name. This is not a forum <laughs> for name shaming um, to borrow money. And we were turned away because we had no financial identity, no record on us. And what that led to is we walked down the streets around Brooklyn Park in Minnesota and borrowed money at over 400% interest rates. And in addition to that, my mother sold my father's wedding ring and a whole bunch of jewelry so we can get his stats in this country. And going back to that true core, which she believed in, paying my school fees to the University of Minnesota. Um, so that's our journey. And we created Isuzu, Simia and I, on the core premise, where you come from, the color of your skin, and above all, your financial identity, like a credit score, should never determine where you end up in the prosperous and the wealthiest nation on the surface of this earth for a start and eventually in the world. And that's that's why we love you. <laughs> this is this is our, our shared belief and you know your story is your story is so powerful and you've lived, you know, you've lived this um, the realities of the the sort of unequal access to financial services in this country so so closely. Um, <clears throat> I think yeah, I mean, the, a lot of people wonder, you know, how you've achieved a tremendous amount, um, obviously starting without a lot. Um, you took great sacrifice sort of pivoting and, and, and going into start a venture. And um, on the one hand, I think a lot of people would ask, you know, why, why give that up? Um, but on, on the other, it seems like um, you have this, you know, tremendous story and this, you know, strong conviction about what our country should look like um, driving you and, and I guess, making you more risk tolerant in your, in your pursuit with Isisu, yeah. um, which we're very grateful for. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, um, as you look at the country, as you look at where you came from in, you know, in Lagos, but then also, you know, where you grew up in, in Minnesota, um, what you've achieved, I think, you know, stands out um, compared to a lot of probably your family members, community members. I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about, you know, how how you see access to opportunity for, um, you know, those who are close to you, those you grew up with in this country. Has it have many of them been able to achieve what you've achieved or have you been sort of an outlier um, in doing what you've done? Uh, that, that's a good question, Eliza. And one thing I would say is everything I have achieved, I don't believe in the concept of we, of, of I. I believe in the concept of we. And that's actually the uh, theology of Isusu's name. Isusu in Yoruba, West African culture, essentially denotes if you want to go fast, you go alone. Or if you want to go far, we fundamentally need to go together. So for me, I stand on the shoulders of giants. And I stand on the shoulders of folks like you as an investor that took a chance on Simi and I and the greater team um, to build something special and help America, you know, regain its soul. To your question, particularly on, you know, folks like us that are immigrants that have made that transition, um, I would say we're outliers. Um, and the reason I would say we're outliers is we all have dreams, we all have aspirations, but at the end of the day, we also have responsibilities. Um, I'm my mother's only son. When I came here, was working at Goldman or PwC. When I told my mother I was going off with Samir mm -hmm. for company, she said, I thought we made it. <laughs> <laughs> and you would understand that from a mother that gave everything she had on this promise of education. And then that hypothesis indeed proved itself to be true. And then, you know, earning over six figures in corporate America, doing very well. 
and working with the finest institutions and saying, look, we have to stop that and really address the real reason and the pains of what got us there. And our philosophy, Simi and I, is really simple. It is, we grew up with nothing. And while we, we have nothing to lose, right? We don't have anything to fall back on. We don't have, I don't have a father that went to Cambridge, or I don't have a father that works in Congress. But I, I don't have a father that's a multi-millionaire to fall back on. All we need to do is fall forward. And that's the way Simi and I thought about it. And for the folks that we walk alongside every day and fellow immigrants like ourselves coming to this country um, to you know, live a better life and pave the way for others, the struggle is real, right? Because if you come to the United States, no credit score. Um, and what happens if my mother didn't take that chance and sell my father's wedding ring? Maybe I would be you know, working at a gas station, which was some of the ideas that was initially proposed to me. So these are some of the things that we should, you know, take into consideration. Um, and, you know, to answer your question more precisely, uh, it is definitely a far cry for others. Um, and people are really going through tough times. Yeah, um, appreciate all of that. So let's uh, let's do a little bit of a deeper dive on Isuzu's current product um, and and sort of product vision like what you know what is what is Isuzu right now and and what's your what does success look like for Isuzu um you know two five ten years from now what are we trying to change <laughs> absolutely so what Isuzu currently does uh, just at a simple level is try to reimagine what we think about financial identity currently um like my mother and I are many millions of Americans your credit score is essentially your lifeline. But you do other things, like you pay your rent on time, you have utilities, bills on time. How can we have a tapestry of information on you to better understand your credit risk? So the way ISUSU fits into that equation today is we capture rental payments data, which amounts to be the largest expense for low to medium income people on a monthly basis work with their landlords and report that data into the credit rating agency. So the, the rule of, you know, the, 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 the statements of record from a financial identity were contributing to is number one, right? And we're boosting people's credit scores. On an average, when you report rental data, the largest expense on a monthly basis, we've seen credit scores go up from 56 points to 101 points. The reason why Which you have- Which is astounding. It's a huge, huge impact. It is yeah. big. And the reason why it is big is, Eliza, if you have a poor credit score, it can cost you over a quarter million dollars in interest over your lifetime. I'm a living example of that because I know how much we paid um, on payday loan, 400% interest, and what that did, you know, following that incident and things we couldn't afford. So that's what it's to do today. Today, capture rental data, transform it, and report it into the credit rating agencies to boost people's credit scores so they can get more financial access. And then in coming years, we want to be able to capture transactional level data from people's bank accounts, you know, think about things like utility data and other data points whereby we now have a tapestry of information and we can create something we like to call the SUSU financial identity. So if you're coming from Lagos, Nigeria, and coming to Minnesota, your financial identity should come with you. And then if you have a job that is paying you and your credit score isn't quite perfect yet, you should look at those variables to underwrite your full risk potential as a human being, but not a derivative of one score. So that's what a SUSU is going to do. But like they always say, you need to build a dog house before you build the White House. And where <laughs> we're going to come today is let's capture what is the largest expense, report that data, and then in subsequent years, which we're already building out right now, we'll be releasing to the world a tapestry of information whereby wherever you go, you can have your social financial identity and you can get financial access and it paints your true credit risk, not the accessory credit risk that was built on a flawed system. Yeah, um, it's a it's great to hear you articulate the the product and the vision so clearly. I um, I you know it's it always it always sort of surprises me how little I think 
many of us understand the reality of sort of like the two financial systems in this country um, for people who have credit scores that are strong and for people who don't. Um, and and the, the recognition of the fact that, you know, millions of Americans who have responsible financial behaviors, um, but simply come without history or, um, you know, have unpredictable income, whatever it is, um, are relegated to this alternative financial system where the products and services that they can access are structured in a way that it's almost impossible to advance within the current credit framework because the pricing is so, you know, so predatory is sort of the word that's used, whether it's, you know, intentionally predatory or not, um, that it's it's just keeping people down and and in the in the you know the way that the credit scores currently are formulated it's just an impossible cycle to break out of um and i i always you know it always surprises me that that there's kind of this lack of recognition that that's that's what we're talking about here it's not that people with low credit scores have access to the same sorts of affordably priced products that others do and aren't paying as well. They don't even have access to, you know, to demonstrate their ability to meet those requirements. Um, so I think what you talk about, about this tapestry of really like understanding the behaviors, the the capabilities um, of, of, you know, this huge swath of our population better um, is just so essential for, for leveling the playing field. And um, we're so we're so glad that you're doing it. We're um, you know what? Do, how do you think about the the system in which you're operating, and sort of what some of the other factors are that will be necessary for a SUSU to achieve its vision? Um, you know, who needs to buy into this vision? Who? What else needs to change in order for this to be successful? It's a fantastic question, Eliza. So when we think about the universe of stakeholders, because we fundamentally believe in a SUSU, at a SUSU that it will take a village and we need different tribes to be part of that conversation. The good news is there are some good folks engaging in this conversation. Number one, which is arguably the most powerful authority right now from a credit information, the likes of Equifax, Experian, TransUnion are engaging actively in the conversation and say, look, you've identified a big problem. How can we contribute and make sure these folks have financial access? And that's why we've worked in lockstep with the credit rating agencies to build a system where we can credibly report rental data into the credit rating agencies, right? So that's, that's powerful and it's encouraging to see that happen. Number two, we need the financial institutions to also be engaged in this conversation because the credit rating agencies might you know capture this information but financial institutions the big ones are not willing to look at people and look at that alternative data or update their systems to reflect the innovations of what the credit rating agencies are putting out we're still going to leave a lot of people behind so to give to contextualize that there are over 70 million people in this country that have a thin credit file or no credit score at all and let's, it's math. It's simple math. Let's do it. You have over 70 million people. The average debt in the United States is $135,000, including mortgage. That's numbers from the Fed. If we do simple mathematics and just multiply those two numbers, we can unlock over $9 trillion. Let me repeat myself. $9 trillion for the American economy. That's not charity. That's fundamentally good for the economy. That can unlock a lot of potential. And that, that is just prosperous for everyone. So we need the financial institutions to be able to take on that risk. And the last dependency, which might sound like a radical idea, is the government needs to have surety programs, just like we created the FDIC, right? To make sure that you know folks are protected in the event that a financial institution can make good on people's deposits. We need to have loan loss reserve funds I'm proposing $2 trillion of it as a starting point. And we can talk about why, because of the historical suppression and racist policies we've had from the beginning of this country, which we'll talk about during this conversation. But a $2 trillion loan, loan loss reserve fund will change behavior and incentivize the financial institutions to say, hey, now we can lend. If this person doesn't perform, the government will step in. And then we have credit scores which the credit rating agencies are excited to work with institutions like ASUSUN and others 
contributing their own book code so we can unlock the true potential of Americans that are being left behind. And if you think $2 trillion is ridiculous, when coronavirus hit, we had $2.8 trillion in free cash unlocked by the Federal Reserve Bank for corporate um, institutions to borrow at zero interest, right? Zero interest for well-established corporations. We all have balance sheets issues. We bail our corporations out. Well, let's bail hard working Americans out. Black folks, brown folks, right? Even white folks that I know from Crookston, Minnesota, working on the sugar beets farm, right? Those people are going through pain also. We need to unlock more capital so we can unleash the true economic prosperity of America. We don't want an America whereby you know, 99% of the wealth is only controlled by 1.2% of the population. That's not the true promise of America. We, we want to see an America whereby everyone has a fighting chance. Everyone has an opportunity to perform and play. But what we need to do is bring stakeholders together and create a win-win solution, which includes the government, financial institutions, and the credit rating agencies. And I fundamentally believe we can do that. Do you think that the financial institutions are um, moving in the direction of alternative financial data, alternative fi financial identity mm -hmm. in the absence of a government backstop? Um, you know, you're much closer to a lot of the conversations with these institutions than we are directly. And I'm curious about the risk appetite you're sensing. Um, there's obviously a huge financial opportunity to better understand and serve low credit, uh, thin credit file, credit invisible consumers. Um, so there's, you know, there should be a, a, a commercial a commercial driver for these institutions as well. And I know we've heard that anecdotally and, and seen slight movement, but I'm just curious in any of in your conversations, um, how how that's sounding and whether you think that government piece is essential or if we're going to see movement um, in advance of that. So, Eliza, it's a fantastic question. I, I think the financial institutions are trying to do what they need to do. By the end of the day, they, we all have fiduciary responsibilities. They need to make a return for their investors. And we currently have a shareholder approach. What we need to change to is a stakeholder approach as, a, as an institution, whereby we're taking into account everyone and giving them a fair shot. So to address your question from a financial institution standpoint, the rhetoric is, yes, we want everyone to participate. But the record is far from that. And I'll be the first person to put it on record and say, look, if your, if your loan book does not reflect the United States and it reflects only a select few, right, you're counting down your debt sentence. It's going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So it is imperative for financial institutions to get involved. And I'm encouraged by some of them that are currently being involved, but it's not enough. It's not enough. That's the reason why we have payday loan lenders. It's not enough, that's the reason why we have pawn shops. It's not enough, that's the reason why some people are being kicked out and 40% of Americans that are renting might be at risk of eviction. It's not enough. As a society, we continue to talk about issues backwards, which is not helpful at all. So here's a practical plan. Well, now we've listened to the rhetoric. So we want more people to be included, but in April, when coronavirus hit, the banks were you know, increasing their balance sheets to deal with the shock. And if you wanted to get a mortgage, you could get a mortgage before 630. Guess where they moved it to? 700. How many low to medium income people have 700 credit scores? You know, Not enough. <laughs> yeah. 12.2%. 12.2%. It is ridiculous. And those that have it don't have a rich credit profile. So it's one thing for us to talk and do the beautiful talk and you know, make ourselves feel good. It is one thing to execute against the promise of our talk, right? And talk about, look, this is our share of profit. This is our revenue. This is our EBITDA, right? Earnings before income tax, depreciation and amortization. And this is the amount we're lending to people that are traditionally left behind. Let's measure what matters. Enough of talking about shareholder approach Let's change to a concept I believe is called justice capitalism. The idea of the current capitalism we have today isn't just working. It isn't working for anyone. It isn't working for brown, black people, 
of folks, everyday farmers, including white folks. It's not working for us. We need justice in this system built on our capitalist structure whereby we say, look, we want to make money, but we want everyone to win. But we can do it. We can do it. All we need to do is eradicate the nightmares of what this country is built on, which is, you know, a shaky scaffold on racist policies. But I believe we can, we can change that um, and do more. I want to go a little deeper on a lot of that um, in, a, in a minute. Um, one thing to hit on quickly before before we go there, because I think um, you know there's a lot to chat about. Um, and you actually, you were responsible for for one of the things I've read this year that I found really powerful in this realm. Um, <laughs> a book called The Color of Law, which which really goes to yeah, this about a year ago you told me to read this. <laughs> um, anyway, as a as a as a former lawyer and as as someone thinking about all these all these things alongside you, it was a it was a really interesting sort of alternative history of of how we've built the country we have built um, with intentionality and um, with really really deep roots of, of racist policies that have landed us where we are. So I, I want to dig, dig in a bit more there um, quickly before we turn. Um, you know, you mentioned some elements of of COVID and how that has um, you know there's been profound sort of economic impact of COVID and obviously the the adverse impact has been disproportionately concentrated with low-income communities, communities of color, both on the health and the economic side. Um, you know, I one in eight American households is food insecure. It's sort of a mind-boggling, the richest country in the world. Um, and we have we have that many millions of people who are struggling to to put food on the table every day and, and certainly put healthy food on the table every day. We have you know, in July, a third of American households missing their housing payments, which is something that's obviously very close to what Asusu is doing. Um, but Asusu's end users <clears throat> are are really this population that is being most adversely affected um, during COVID. And so I'm just curious um, to hear a bit more about what you've seen specifically in the housing market and the eviction risk. You mentioned that a little bit. Um, how you're managing that with with your product and and with the with how Asusu functions and interacts with the credit agencies and um, you know any I know you all put an innovative um, sort of emergency fund together to address this and we'd love to hear hear a bit more about that as well. Absolutely, um, thanks, Eliza. So just to it, it is important that we learn from the mistakes of the past um, and to accurately paints the picture of what we're doing. We need to go back in time. And we need to go back in time to 1619 when the first African-Americans came to these shores whereby they were kidnapped and brought to the United States. Um, and you know, slavery happened. But just before we had Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, we had one important law, right? Buchanan versus, um, I, I, no, sorry, Dred Scott versus Stanford, uh, the case in 1857, just before, you know, emancipation, emancipation proclamation that essentially said, look, black folks cannot have citizenship. You know, you're not considered, you're considered property, essentially. And then we had reconstruction, one of the, you know, most prosperous time in American history from 1863 to 1877, that those 13 years. All right, we had a lot of interesting things, but we went back. But then it's important to point back, point out Buchanan versus Waverly, which was essentially a Supreme Court case that said blatantly in our own law that African Americans, if whites want to sell their homes, they cannot sell it to African Americans, right? And we had more, you know, racist laws in 1917, but the most recent one. So people don't think that, oh wow, this is in the 1800s, this is in the, you know, early 1900s, in 1947, right? We had people actually have it in their deeds, and in some cases till today, whereby the housing authorities would say you cannot sell your houses to people of color or black people in this case, right? And the Federal Housing Authority that's supposed to be responsible and upholding the equal housing for everyone fundamentally backed these policies. So that's the etiology, and that's the journey of where we're coming from. And fast forward to 2008, Right, where we have collateralized debt obligation, where some financial institutions fundamentally bet against people of color again, and then they lost their home. For everyone listening, the biggest driver of wealth is home ownership. 
the, the it, it accounts for over 76 percent of the average we white wealth in this country the average white wealth is around 149,000 dollars it's home ownership but if you've seen this you know account of racist policies that fundamentally left people behind particularly black folks in this country and then 2008 hit that affected everyone when America had a cold, black folks had pneumonia in those cases, right? And now we have coronavirus and the same thing is happening. In, during coronavirus, we saw at this issue at that over 62% of people on our platform could not afford rent. And guess what? 89% plus were African-Americans, right? And then you had, you know, another, uh, I think, 9% Latino, right? That couldn't essentially afford their rent. And what we decided to do is, how can we right the wrong? Because what we're saying from my account is a symptom of a larger disease in this country. So what we decided to do is reach out to our investors, Acumen included, um, and we created something called the Housing Probability Loan under the guise of a rent relief fund, where we offer zero interest loans to people. Um, and we came to investors like Acumen that, you know, Acumen eventually um, backed us and make sure that we can make sure uh, we can ensure um, tenants are not being kicked out. And as a society, we're not solving homelessness backwards. So we did that from as early as you know, late April, May, June. And today, we've received north of $6 million in loans requests, not the ones we funded. But what that capital has done, particularly from institutions like Acumen, that initial uplift um, to support this you know, initiative we had on our roadmap, we've had other financial institutions like Kiva that had lent over $1.7 billion on their balance sheets. We've had other credit unions and CDFIs partnering and saying, refer some of these loans to us so we can make sure we stand by these folks and do the right thing. And then above all, we're seeing philanthropic institutions coming together to make sure as a society, we do not solve homelessness backward. And if you think about this model, it's a win-win solution. It's just partners with the landlords, reports rental data. If a tenant can afford their rent, we step in, afford, um, provide affordable interest loans, pay the landlord. So we're not in the business of victimizing people. We're not saying, hey, landlord, you're horrible, because we think proximity matters here. The landlord needs to pay his or her mortgage at the end of the day. And we need to think about those considerations. Well, how do we make sure the tenant does, it, is not, does not also end up on the street? So we pay the landlord, the tenant stays in their home. And then by the way, we talk to the landlord and say, you can evict this person you know, for the next two months after they pay the amount. That's a leverage, right? And that's how we need to think about our, our, our solutions in the form of justice, whereby we want to stand with you and do the right thing and not point fingers, but you must also do right by the people that live in your buildings. And today, we've been able to, now, if we're looking at the balance sheets of our partners, you know, we're, talk, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars. The devil is in, is in the detail about, you know, what acceptance rates would look like in all transparency and reality. But what we've been able to do is acumen invested in us to come up with this lofty, you know, um, esoteric idea. But it turned out to be something that works. When we said rent relief in April, everyone laughed at us. Acumen and other stakeholders said yes. And guess what? The New York State implemented a rent relief program that looked exactly like us. We're not going to confirm or deny if we're involved. <laughs> in Minnesota, $100 million has been launched and multiple cities and states in the United States. But when we started, people said we were crazy. We got to lead. We got to take risk. And that's what we believe startups are for. And it takes investors like Acumen and many others to take that bet. And that's how we can really fulfill and right the wrong of this nation and level the playing field for as many as we can. This is just the starting point. We're not the end all be all. There are a lot of things that need to be addressed. By the end of the day, what we want to do is a basic need. No one should be left on the street, number one. And if you want to borrow money and you can borrow that money, you shouldn't be turned away because of something like your financial identity. And that's how everything ties together with it, Susie. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, it, it's been, you guys 
you guys did this up before you had investor commitment, which I think was, um, from our perspective, doubly uh, inspiring. <laughs> um, you know, you put your you put yourselves on the line. I know you made personal contributions to this effort in the early days, and um, I just love the I love the creativity and um, that you guys demonstrated, and 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 the leadership really. Um, and I think you're seeing that. I mean, as you spoke about, there's it's one thing. It's it's essential that we inspire people to do right um, and to and to feel a sense of collective, um, you know, I don't want to say responsibility. We'll get into terminology that will make people think we're rabid socialists or something like that. Um, <laughs> but um, but but understanding this expense of of eviction, the expense of homelessness, um, there are actually aligned incentives. Um, that sometimes it takes a new actor and a new vision to to really bring to light for for multiple stakeholders. And so, um, yeah, really, really excited by by the model that you all built and then to see that there's more there seems to be more um, engagement with this with this concept of how do we how do we keep people in their homes and how do we protect people from economic shocks that are out of their control? Um, and and recognizing that that's really in the interest of all of us, um, whether we're the landlord or the tenant. Um, so anyway, super exciting and inspiring work. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to turn a little bit back to you know on top of COVID, we had um, the the murder of George Floyd in in May, which I think you know has been a, a tremendous um, event kind of in our national consciousness this year, uh, obviously building upon the deaths of many, many others unjustly. Um, but, you know, his murder, I think, really ignited sort of a resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement um, and sparked this very overdue reckoning of, of the state of racial justice in this country. And I think something that a lot of people hadn't uh, hadn't fully sort of come to terms with. Um, and, and haven't yet. But, you know, as we've been, our work, we see the overlap of poverty, of race, of, of opportunity every day, you know, across the sectors that we work in, financial services, health, um, workforce opportunity. Um, you know, we still have stats in this country in where Black women are dying three times higher rates than white women in childbirth. We have, you know, very limited diversity in the higher income strata of, of um, of different careers, and um, and we obviously all the things we've been talking about in the financial services sector um, heavily influenced by 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 race and and <clears throat> in terms of the access that you have. So, you know, we see this every day, but I and sort of understand those macro <laughs> macro issues, um, many challenges to unpack there. I want to talk a little bit about. Um, you know, you've you've spoken to sort of the deeply structural racist roots that have landed us where we are. Um, and I would, you know, love anything more that you have on that. But also when I talk about this, like very visceral and personal experience that I think people across races and across the country have had in the last several months as we grapple with the deaths of George Floyd and so many others. Um, and just the way that um, it profoundly, you know, the continuing racial injustice in this country profoundly affects the day-to-day -day lives of a huge number of Americans, specifically Black Americans, in their sense of physical security in this country. Um, and I know I know you grew up in Minnesota, actually right near where George Floyd was murdered. And so this very like symbolic national event um, was very close to home as well. Um, and so I just, uh, yeah, I'd love to, to chat a bit more about sort of how, how you're thinking about <clears throat> Where we are right now, as we're all um, thinking and talking and 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 strategizing about where this country is, both on very personal, individual levels, and then, you know, what we're seeing is out, outpouring from corporations of, you know, commitments to 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 greater racial equity in the future. You know, what's real and what do we what do we actually believe is is going to be happening? I th thanks, Eliza. And, you know. What happened in Minnesota, um, particularly to George Floyd, um, the murder of George Floyd um, was tough um, on my end. Like you rightfully said, I, you know, I, I, I my journey started in the United States and in, in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, and you know, I learned how to drive actually um, not too far um, from my friends, from where he was strangled and 
you know, murdered in broad daylight, just like an animal. And what that did, looking at that video second by second, is just painful to watch another man, you know, put his knee on someone's neck and he was pleading for his life. He was pleading for his life. And we watched in that video, his life is so essentially evaporated from his body. And it is tough because it, it can just happen to anyone. You know, you know, man, that could have been me, right? Right, like, cause that could have been anyone, that could have been any black person. But just to watch something like that, it really, it really talks about the issues like, what does our life actually account for, right? You know, African-Americans were brought to this country in 1619, you know, against their will, raped, murdered, enslaved, and all the racist policies we talked about, and still yet continue to rise. But the systemic nature of this suppression needs to stop. And if it doesn't stop, we can really realize the true potential of what this country truly is. It is utterly imperfect, regardless of what we talk to ourselves about. And for me, you know, looking at that video was just, it was just painful. And it brought back a whole bunch of things that have happened to me personally. You know, either walking to, you know, um, in corporate America, walking into a meeting with my associates and someone asking me to take notes when I'm the manager. Um, or, you know, walking on the streets on one side and it's 8.30 in the evening and someone else is crossing the other side. Or being stopped by a sheriff on 94 in Minnesota and just saying, look, you know, is this the end of my life? It shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't be terrorized by the system that's structured to protect us. I know there are good cops out there. There are good folks out there. They're just trying to uphold the rule of law, but we need to do better as a society. Um, and you know, there's one, it is great to protest. It is great to go out there and talk about what we you know, believe in, but we need to make sure we don't stop our rhetoric. You know, people have been protesting since the, you know, the 1700s, the 1600s, and it continues. We need to talk about how we right the wrongs of this country and stop the rhetoric. Like the rhetoric, every time I see on our talking head on TV, talking about what's going to happen and how this hurt, I'm just sick and tired of it. How can we move forward? What are pragmatic solutions that creates a win-win structure uh, and how can we move forward? There are a lot of things, like you said, more black women die at childbirth. Why? We're not researching. We have a, you know, nomothetic approach to our medicine system um, in terms of researching on, on what works. We don't even understand what the black woman's body does. Right? It's a shame. You know, we're talking about income inequality. The average white family has 10 times as more wealth than the average black family of 14 times as more wealth than the average Latino family. You know, we're talking about the school to prison pipeline whereby we have, you know, we have places that are predominantly black being policed and terrorized every day. When the data tells, tells us that, you know, you have more white kids and black kids committing the same level of crime, but it depends on who you catch. And we're having crazy sentences relegating people to prison and people are living without, you know, a complete household. You know, that's, that's just not right. That's not the true promise of what this country stands for. Albeit, and I'll be unapologetic to talk about it, the founding fathers, although they are cowards, you know, or hypocrites, the, the, their writings were quite profound and it is up to us. Um, to lead to those ideas. And I'm very optimistic because at the end of the day, you know, hopelessness is the enemy of progress. And regardless of what has happened in the past, I still fundamentally believe in the wise words of Brian Stevenson. You know, each of us are better than the worst things we've done. At the end of the day, what a white family, a black family, a Latino family wants is for their child to do better. Just like Eunice, my mother, 
all he wanted or she wanted Abby to do me is to be better than what my father was or what she could ever imagine. That's what every American wants until we shake the racist structures, the foundation of this country and right the wrong of the past. We're going to be locked in bondage. We need to unlock ourselves, whether you're white, whether you're black, whether you're Hispanic, whether you're blue, whether you're Republican, mm -hmm. I don't care. All we need is just sets of policies and unlock us from the shackles of the founding fathers. They are not perfect. We are not perfect. But we need to be more hopeful. Because at the end of the day, the only way we deal with poverty, in my opinion, in our capitalist system isn't working, it needs to be really underscored on justice capitalism. So that's how I feel about it. Thank you, Abby. Um, I have always have so many more questions for you and I, I love hearing your thoughts and everything. I see um, my colleague Catherine has hopped on as well because I have a feeling some of our audience might have some, some questions for you too, but is that why you're here with us, Catherine? <laughs> yeah, and Abby, you make it nearly impossible to jump on. <laughs> And cut this off because I think we could uh, keep going. So appreciate how you have shared um, your story and the story of Susu with all of us. I think there's so much to learn um, from you and, and so many of the concepts, um, particularly this idea of justice capitalism, I think are um, things we are proud to stand by with you. Um, but we do have a, the, a number of great questions from the audience and I will just dive into those. Um, the first is from uh, Danny Allen in Oakland, who says, um, uh, what are the major barriers to your vision? Um, specifically, the wealth gap in America is accelerating. So is this something that those benefiting from this gap will be interested in uh, in reversing the gap? So really, where, where do you see the barriers to your vision and, and how do you think about overcoming those? Um, thanks, Catherine. The, the, the barriers to our, uh, to our vision is really a stakeholder approach. We need all hands on deck, so we need the, the government to unlock the $2 trillion you know, loan loss reserve fund so we can unlock more capital so the financial institutions can lend more um, to people that have been left behind. And then the credit rating agencies are working alongside us from a technology standpoint to make that happen. The good news is we can leverage, we can leverage technology to solve a lot of issues, but the main pain point here is the courage, and not just courage, the moral courage of our institutions. Catherine, if we can borrow $2.8 trillion to, Amer to corporate America at zero interest, I think we can allocate $2 trillion in loan loss reserve fund. It's not free money, it's just, loan it's just insurance policy so the banks can be incentivized to lend more money. Because I'm not the kind of person that believes in false fallacy or false odds and say, hey, banks, you know, unlock more capital for people of color. It's not gonna happen. We know it's not gonna happen. So incentivize and put your money where your mouth is. And that's what I am calling on the US government to do, period. You bought corporate America $2.8 trillion and that money showed up in less than 30 days. Democrats, Republican on the air, do your job, $2 trillion, loan loss reserve fund. So we make sure people don't get evicted, number one, and corporate America, the financial institutions can unlock more capital. That's the major barrier. And until we, we, we address those things, you know, all stakeholders are going to do is just talk about how beautiful black lives are um, or how we need to do better, but nothing happens. And we deal with the repercussions as tech companies in the front lines of these issues. Thanks. Um, a question from Charlotte in New York who says, many low-income uh, low Isuzu customers will be newly able to use their credit scores to access other financial products. How do you think about ensuring that those customers, a new segment for those financial services providers, don't fall victim to predatory financial service companies or policies down the line? Fantastic question, Charlotte. One of the things we must do with the strong level of financial identity is credit education. So we're going to give a big shout out to our partners at Equifax. We partnered with Equifax to be able to get credit scores for free. So if you're an Isuzu user, um, um, community member, you get access to your credit scores for free. And we do not send you draconian, inch, um, you know, crazy interest loan products. We say, this is your financial identity. This is what it means. 
And then by doing that, what we can also refer you to non-predatory programs. So to Charlotte's point, the starting point is let us improve credit scores. So that unlocks a lot of capital anywhere. But above all, we need to also have credit education, which we do at Isuzu when people download the, um, the, rent, the, the rent mobile app on the app store. So it shows you what your credit score means and the power of it so you're not duped by um, you know, predatory lenders. And by law, a predatory lender, when you, you're not even, you don't even fall in their, in their class anymore when you have a credit score that's above 650. That's what this country was built on, Charlotte. What this country was built on and the wealth we have is cheap interest loans given to predominantly white folks to be able to buy homes, right? Zero interest loans, the GI Bill, what happened in Levittstown. And what we're asking Charlotte is educates more people and unlock the majority of this capital. So Charlotte, Charlotte, in a nutshell, credit education, unlock more capital for folks that have been left behind. And we can really, um, in our own estimates, unlock over $9 trillion for you know, the American economy. Thanks. Uh, and there were, Abby, uh, uh, many questions about your personal journey and how you overcame barriers early on to starting uh, the company. Uh, one question that jumped out is how do you sustain this level of urgency around your mission? Um, put the rest of it, well, also recognizing the time that it will take to shift such a complex and deeply ingrained system of inequality. How would you advise other young leaders on holding this tension between patience and urgency? Thanks, Catherine. My, my perspective is fall forward. Um, I came from uh, the slums of Lagos, Nigeria. I have nothing to lose. You're going to catch me fighting. It seems like an impossible task, but guess what? We had a rent relief program that now it's moving cities to unlock hundreds of millions of dollars. And we're not stopping there. We're not satisfied with hundreds of millions of dollars. We're going to the billions and now asking the federal government for trillions, right? We're not satisfied. Do, does it affect me relationship-wise, family-wise? Do I get enough sleep? I'll be very honest, no. But I would rather die trying to make sure my fellow human beings, black folks, you know, brown folks, white folks, everyone in the world do have a fair shot. That's what we think, that's what I think I was created here to do on this earth. My partner and I, Samir, have dedicated our lives just to make sure everyone has a fair shot because our parents weren't given that fair shot. And we're, you're going to catch us dying trying to make that happen. So I'm not going to make it easy. It is, it is, it is hard. You're going to have pains with relationship. You're not going to have all the friends in the world, but at the end of the day, on your deathbed, <laughs> you want to be remembered by four. Do right. you want to be remembered by someone that amassed all the wealth and stayed in your corporate ivory towers or someone that fought to make sure people have a fighting chance? I prefer the latter. Um, and, and on that note, struck by your hopefulness, you know, even in these incredibly heavy times in the U.S. And as a final question, just where that sense of hope comes from and what gives you hope about the future right now uh, for your company and for where we are in the U.S.? Where my hope comes from, um, Catherine, is my faith. Um, you know, I, I'm a person of faith and believe in the impossible. Um, and one of the things to me and I, my co-founder, always talk about is reimagining the possible, the impossible. If we think about the status quo alone, we're not going to achieve anything. Um, so, you know, for us, there are a lot of things which we've, you know, outlined in this conversation that needs to happen. Um, but, you know, that sense of hope, that sense of faith that you believe and you just keep walking and chipping at it every day. And one day, you know, regardless, um, you know, there's an African-American saying, you hang around the barbershop, sooner or later you're going to get a haircut. But it'll take a long time because you have 100 people waiting to get their haircut. But you will get it. It's patience, perseverance, and above all, you do need faith. Because sometimes we fall flat on our face. Sometimes the doors get shut on us. But the way we've structured our lives is we drive, we, we, we rode a huge ship to an island. We bounce the ship. And think about that ship as America. 
we're going to build a beautiful steel ship and sail around the world. That's our mentality. We need to deconstruct the system that isn't working. And that's where we are mentally. It is just, it is everything or nothing. Thank you. And thanks for bringing that uh, hopefulness to all of our days today. It's a dark, uh, it's literally black outside in, in San Francisco right now with uh, smoke from the fires in California. So it was a bright spot in my morning. And I think for, for so many of us, um, thank you, Abby. Uh, before we drop, just also want to acknowledge the partners that make Acumen America's work possible. Uh, many of them are on the phone today. Uh, MetLife Foundation is the funder of our work in financial inclusion and um, and, and supports your work, Abby. Uh, Robert Johnson Foundation, Barclays, Dalio Foundation, Autodesk Foundation, Capital One, and Johnson & Johnson. Uh, deeply grateful for their support. And we will be back uh, next Thursday at 11.30 a.m. Pacific time with Ashley Williams from MindRight. Um, thank you, Eliza. Thank you, Abby. And thanks all for joining thank us. Thank you, Abby. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Catherine.